Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. It is good to be with you. It is good to see you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. To get started, we're going to play a little game. You didn't know we played games in church, did you? So it's probably a game that you're familiar with, that you've seen versions of this game before. If you think of like follow the cup or the ball that's underneath the cup. If you go to a Brewers game, they have it on the big screen, follow the ball that's under the Brewers hat. All you have to do is follow the container of full M&Ms. It's right here, just if you're wondering. It's right here. The the full container's right there. And then you have an empty container here, and you have another empty container here. All you have to do is follow the full container, right? It's that simple. So if I move it around, where is the full container? It's all the way on the right. I guess that would be your left, right? Well, if that's what you think, it's a good guess, but you'd be wrong. It's not there. Nor is it in the middle. It's actually still over here on the right. It's still there. So, let's try it again. You think you can do it again? I mean, it's, I didn't move. I don't have, like, I'm not moving fast. I'm not moving fast. It's right here, right? Your right, my left, right here. Let's try it again. Where is it? Where is it? Well, now, now you're just guessing because you don't know where it is, <laughs> right? You would think it's in the middle. It's not in the middle. I know. Oh, come on. It's still right here. It's still right there. Let's try it one more time. All I'm going to do is give it just a few, few moves. And where is it now? You would think it's right here, right? It's not here. <laughs> it's right here. Now, if you wonder, like, why they always say, does a magician have anything up his sleeve? It's because they probably do, right? <laughs> so these are actually all empty M&M containers. The full M&M container is right there. Now, I, I know, you're like, okay, we thought he actually knew magic. <laughs> now we realize he doesn't know anything, which is true. But I, I, I don't know about you, but like life sometimes throws us these funny curveballs, right? And, and life sometimes can be mysterious and, and uncertain. And sometimes that can be really frustrating, right? Like anybody frustrated in just those few minutes? Like what in the world is going on? Sometimes it can be fun. Like if you're just allowing like something like a magic trick to kind of bring you to a place of awe, like, oh, how do they do that? But sometimes it can be frustrating. And and what I'm coming to learn and what I'm coming to find to be true is that the more I experience of life and the more thoughtful I am about that experience— the more I'm coming to learn how much I don't know about life, right? Anybody else been there before? Maybe there now? Yeah. And again, sometimes it's like, okay, that's okay. Sometimes that can be really frustrating. But also, that's not only true of just life in general. I'm finding that to be true in my relationship with God. Meaning, the more I engage with God— the more I follow God, the more I experience Him, and the more I'm thoughtful about that experience, the more I grow to realize how much I actually don't know about God. Like, I actually don't know more about God than I do know, right? If, if you could, you know, objectify knowledge of God, like if you could say these objects kind of represent our knowledge of God, The more you go through life, you probably collect more knowledge of God or more experience with God. Maybe this little bucket represents your life. And, you know, each year you kind of gain more knowledge and more experience with God and you put it in and you think to yourself, man, I'm gaining a lot. I'm growing. I'm learning all sorts of things about God. It's just filling up. But the reality is no matter how much we gain in life, no matter how much of our experience and our knowledge of God grows, at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, maybe our bucket is half full. And the knowledge of God represented by blocks would fill up from floor to ceiling a room like this chock full. And what we know is about like this. Meaning God is so huge. He is so vast. There is so much to him. Sometimes when we're young, we're in this place like, I 
I know a lot. I've learned a lot. I've gained a lot of knowledge of God. But the more and more we follow him, the more we experience of him, and the more we reflect on that experience, it's natural to come to the conclusion, I don't know God. And all there is to know about him, like I think I do. Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, God speaking this through Isaiah, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. They're, they're more vast. And sometimes that can be like awe-inspiring. Sometimes that can be really frustrating. It can be really challenging because sometimes it's like, God, I think I have you figured out, but I don't have you figured out. And so the question is, how do we respond? How do we engage when we are bumping up against the magnitude and mystery of God in our lives? When we're wrestling with trying to understand the mysterious nature of who God is, and even asking the question, like, is, is that okay? We love certainty, don't we? We love knowing. We love figuring things out. So is it okay? Is it even okay to say God is mysterious in who he is? And how he works. Uh, Paul will use that language as we begin to wind down chapter 11 of Romans. He will begin to name this idea of God being mysterious and how we should respond. This is the way our passage begins. This is Romans 11, starting in verse 25. Paul writes this. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. So Paul is in a section of Romans, chapter 9 through 11, where Paul is talking about how the Jews throughout their history have repeatedly rejected God and turned their back on him. And in doing so, the Israelites were not able to fulfill their covenant calling of being a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Uh, essentially, God's plan all along was to call the Israelites to be his chosen people so that through the Israelites, he would extend salvation to the entire world through Israel. But because Israel kept rejecting God, turning their back on him, they were unable to fulfill their covenant calling. And so what Paul has been saying through this section is that even in spite of their rejection of God, God still moves his promise forward. He still moves his plan forward, and he has included the Gentiles into the family of God's people. Now, if you remember, the church in Rome, the church to which Paul is writing, is a church made up of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Jews who grew up in the Jewish faith, knew all of the Old Testament, the covenant, the rituals, traditions— saw that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament and started to follow him. And then there's Gentile Christians who grew up with none of that, knew none of that, but heard that Jesus is a new kind of king, a better king than Caesar, and they're saying, ah, I want Jesus to be my king. So they're both a part of this church in Rome, and this church is divided. It's divided on this ethnic line of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, each group being at odds with each other because each group thinks that they are better or more superior than the other. It's like the Jewish Christians are saying like, hey, we started this thing. We were the original chosen people. We were called to be God's special possession. We are the ones who really got this thing going. And then the Gentile Christians are saying, yeah, but you couldn't fulfill your covenant calling. You couldn't do and be the people that God called you to be. So he had to bring us in to keep this thing going. So obviously, we are more superior than you. I mean, it sounds like the thing that little kids do on the playground, right? Like, I'm better than you. My dad can beat up your dad sort of thing, right? But here they are, like all entangled in this. And so Paul is writing to them to try and sort this out. And in Romans 11, he's specifically speaking to the Gentiles. If you were to back up to like verse 10 or 11, he says, and I'm talking to you Gentiles. And what he's trying to tell them here is his encouragement is don't be conceited, right? He says that I'm writing this to you so that, this is the, midway through verse 25, so that you may not be conceited. And the thing he's trying to give them in order to help them in their humility is a mystery, a mystery. He says, I'm telling you this mystery so that you may not be conceited, which is a little odd, right? 
a little odd. If you were to come to me and you have this realization, like, Brian, you know what? I walk around and I judge people like crazy. Like every time I see somebody, I find something wrong with them. I figure out why I'm better and it's driving me crazy. It's hurting my relationships and I need somebody to help me figure out how not to do that. And then I say to you, ah, I have just the thing for you. Take this to heart. The sun sets in the west. And the stars, they sparkle at night. Just follow the moon, and it will be your guiding light. Peace to you, my child. <laughs> You'd be like, what? Like, that does nothing for me. Like, if you come to me asking for help because of this problem in your life, and I give you a riddle, and I send you on your way, you're like, I'm never going back to that guy. Like, he has no idea what he's talking about. He is a horrible pastor, because what you're looking for is advice at best, right? Maybe a spiritual practice that can help you engage in what God's doing in your life. A mystery wouldn't at all appear to be helpful. And Paul is saying, here, here is a mystery to help you in your humility. And so it raises the question, okay, what is this mystery? What is this mystery that he's talking about? He goes on to say this in verse 25. He says, Israel has experienced a hardening in part, right? Because of their repeated rejection, their hearts have grown hard, and God has given them over to their rejection. He's saying, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles comes in. So it sounds like Paul is saying that this mystery is that Israel has a hard heart because of their repeated rejection of God, right? But their hardness of heart isn't really the full mystery of what Paul is talking about. Because when you see Paul use the word mystery in other letters, because he uses it somewhat regularly, he uses this word mystery somewhat regularly, what you see is that the emphasis isn't so much on Israel having a hard heart, but rather the emphasis is on the inclusion of Gentiles into the family of God. And not just that they have been brought in, but now they are on equal footing as the Jews and the Israelites. So therefore, there isn't anybody in the family of God who is superior to anybody else. We are all on the same playing field. And you see this idea most explicit in his letter uh, to the Ephesians. You see it in Ephesians 3, starting in verse 2. He says, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's mystery that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. In reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Basically saying the mystery of God is no longer a mystery. It was at one point in time, but now it's been fully revealed. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, this mystery is, essentially here it is, that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So essentially, at one point in time, the mystery was that God had this plan to create a worldwide family of his people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And if it was supposed to happen through Israel, but Israel continually rejects God and turns their back on God and has a hard heart towards God, the mystery was, like, how is God going to fulfill his plan? Like, if he's trying to do it through the Israelites, and the Israelites are going the other direction, how in the world is God going to fill his plan? And so what God does, the mystery being revealed, the mystery being disclosed, is Jesus. That Jesus comes to be the true Israelite, who is and does for Israel and the rest of the world what Israel and we can't do for ourselves. He comes to be the true Israelite who advances God's plan to extend his salvation to the entire world regardless of how often we reject God, how much sin is in our life, or how hard our hearts are. 
He comes to extend God's salvation, to be and do for Israel and for us what they and we couldn't do for ourselves. And so then the question remains, if that's true, what does that mean for the Jewish people? Like, if they're continually wandering away, where does that leave them? And Paul goes on to say this in verse 26. And in this way, this way being with Jesus, being the true Israelite who brings salvation to them in the world, all Israel will be saved. Which is like, well, what does that mean? I mean, do they get a free pass just because they're ethnically Israelites? Does that mean it doesn't matter what they do? They're going to be let in because God loves them more than everybody else? Like, that's a highly debated verse. And like, so many scholars have written so many pages on it. But he goes on to say this, as it is written, the deliverer, the deliverer will come from Zion, which is a reference to Jesus, and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Jacob is just another way to say Israel as a nation. It's a personification of a group of people given the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from long, long ago. And then he says, and this is my covenant. Essentially, this is my promise with them when I take away their sins. See, Paul seems to be reinforcing that even though Israel has rejected God, there is hope for them. And the hope is and through the person of Jesus Christ. It's not as though anybody gets a free pass. It's about pointing people to Jesus. Some scholars think maybe that's just a reference to say more Israelites will come into the faith. Maybe at some point in time there'll be a large one-time conversion, revival of Israelites. Some people use this verse continually to try and figure out when God is going to send Jesus to return. Like maybe there's a certain number of Gentiles that have to come into the faith so that there's a certain number of Israelites who then will follow and then Jesus will return. It's one of the most confusing passages in all of Romans. What does it mean that all of Israel will be saved? And I think what Paul is saying here is like, I'm just trying to reinforce everything I've always said up to this point. That it's through Jesus. That there's still hope for anybody, Jew and Gentile alike. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've come. It doesn't matter your background. All are welcome into the family of God. So that means for Israel, there's still hope. There's still hope. For, for those in our world today who continually reject God, there's still hope. And he goes on to say this in verse 28. As far as the gospel is concerned... They are enemies for your sake, meaning they have rejected the gospel, and sin still is the defining reality of their life, for them and for those who reject God. But as far as election is concerned, right, as God's chosen people, they are loved on the account of the patriarchs, meaning they're still God's chosen people, verse 29, for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Like, God can't go back on his promises. He gave promises to the Israelites generations and generations and thousands of years ago, and he's saying, I'm still going to be good on my promises. I'm still going to be faithful to my people, even when they reject me. And the thing I'm going to continually call them to is a recognition and a submission and humility to receive who I am in the person of Jesus because it's in and through him I'm bringing reconciliation and redemption to the entire world. He's trying to communicate that for those who continually reject God, Jew or Gentile alike, there is still hope. And what he's doing throughout this whole section, Romans 9, 10, and 11, is he's trying to encourage and motivate the church in Rome to be on mission to reach those people, Jew and Gentile alike, who are rejecting God. He's saying yes to those people in Rome, the church. There are Jews who are rejecting God. There's also Gentiles rejecting God. We live in a world where people are continually turning their back on God. And he's saying, don't let that cause you to lose sight of God's mission. Because the thing that we have in the gospel is the hope for the entire world. That through Jesus, one day, all things will be made right. And he says in chapter 10, back up one chapter, he says in chapter 10, how will people believe if they haven't heard? And how will people hear 
if no one is proclaiming, preaching, naming, saying the gospel for them? And who will do it if no one is sent? Paul is trying to encourage the church in Rome. Stop squabbling about who's better, right? He says in chapter 3, no one is righteous. Stop having your petty little arguing matches, but focus on who Jesus is and what he has done and what he is trying to do in and through you. And what's easy to miss through this section is Paul's emotional tone. Because if you back up to chapter 9, verse 2, he says that my heart is full of sorrow. He says, I have this unceasing anguish in my heart because my people have not recognized who Jesus is. And he lived that himself. He rejected God. His heart was hard towards God. God had to arrest him and get his attention in order for him to see Jesus really was who he says he was. And so he has this unceasing anguish in his heart. He says in chapter 9, verse 3, that I wish I would be cursed and cut off from God so that my people would be able to be brought back in. And again, there's a lot of like scholarly debate around this section. And what does it mean that all Israel will be saved? And how should we anticipate what that means for the second coming of Christ? And when Israel took back the land in 1948, was that something else that was, you know, a marker in the end times? And I mean, there's a place for those discussions. But it's really easy to lose sight of what Paul is saying and doing here when we get all tangled up in that. Because it's personal for Paul. He's saying, there are people who I know by name, who I love dearly, who are walking away from Jesus. And it's tearing me up inside. Paul is in anguish over this. And so for us, knowing that, we have to ask the question, if Paul is worried about his people, who are my people? Like, who are my people? If Paul's people are the Jewish people, who are my people, right? Who are the people in my life that I would say are my people? And how do I feel about them? How do I feel about their response to God? I can remember when I was in high school, uh, I worked at this summer camp in New Hampshire. Uh, we get back there every year and I get a chance to speak at this camp, which is really meaningful for me. Because it was a camp that God used in my life to really solidify my faith and call me into ministry. This was my, the summer after my junior year of high school, going into my senior year. I was there all summer. And it was just this great experience because students and college students from all over the Northeast would come live at this camp for the summer, do all these different jobs, and you would make friends from all up and down the East Coast. And you got to grow in your faith and work with other people, make great friendships, have role models who are a little bit older than you who take their faith seriously and you can look up to them. And it was just the time of my life. And at the end of the summer, you go back home, right? Everybody says goodbye. You go back home and you go to your real life. And this town I grew up in in New Hampshire, a small, quaint, 25,000 person town, had a Main Street with the picturesque white church with the big steeple at the end of Main Street with the traffic circle there and a gazebo right in the middle. And so I got home from camp and just we're walking Main Street as a family. We we're going to get ice cream or something. And I'm looking at all the people around me in my hometown. I'm just filled with sorrow. I'm just sad. So I'm like, I had the summer of my life. I had the best summer of my life growing in my faith, making new friends, seeing Jesus at work in clear ways. And I don't know if these people have ever experienced that. Have they ever experienced that? What is my responsibility in communicating that to them? And I wonder if you've ever had an experience like that, where you had a moment of sorrow for your people, whoever your people are, to say, do they know Jesus? And is there hope that maybe they could and someday would? And so the question remains, who are your people? Who are your people? Maybe for some of you here this morning, it's your family. It's your immediate family. It's your extended family. You know that there are people in your family who you love deeply, who you care about deeply, 
and they could care less about God. And maybe even at one point in their life, they had a conversion type experience and it seemed like there was a real relationship with Jesus, but now they're just walking faster and faster away. Who are your people? Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe you've lived in the same house here in Tosa for the last 25 years and Mr. Johnson lives right next door and you're like, maybe Mr. Johnson is my people. I've been in his house. He's been in mine. We've watched our kids grow up together. But where's Mr. Johnson in his faith? Like, does he know the Lord? Is there any burden in our hearts for our neighbors to know the love of Christ and we have the opportunity to extend it to them? Who are your people? As we go back into the school year, many of us are going to be back into the schools and in school systems, rubbing shoulders with all sorts of people. And all through the summer, you've seen that your kids have had play dates with other families and gone to their house, and they all go to school together, and their kids have come to your house and had play dates with your kids. And you just find yourself now starting to enter back into relationship with them in a new way, just simply because of the school year. Maybe they are your people. Who are your people? And how do you feel about them? Do you have a burden for them? You know, when I was uh, a few years married, we had maybe uh, Kate, maybe Emma, maybe two kids. Um, I got my wedding band tattooed on my finger. Uh, I used to play with my wedding ring all the time like ridiculously, right? I would flip it around in my fingers in meetings. I'd take it off and I'd spin it on the table as I'm having a meeting with people. I would take it off when I cooked and worked out or worked in the yard. At times, my kids would find my wedding ring somewhere in the house and they would bring it to me and they'd say, Dad, you need this. And so somewhere along the way, we used to joke, I should just get that thing tattooed on because then I never have to worry about taking it off and leaving it somewhere. And then sure enough, the day came when I actually lost it for a period of a few weeks, I'm like, I guess we're getting it tattooed on. Might as well just do that instead of going to get another wedding band. So I got that tattooed on, and I remember going to the tattoo parlor that day, and that was the only thing I'd ever had done. And I walked out of the tattoo parlor. Becky was with me, and the very first thing I said was, you know, if I were to get another one, like never before that moment in my life had I really planned out like having any tattoos at all, And the first thing in my head as I walk out is like, if I were to get another one, what would I get? And I was already planning. And so the next tattoo I got was a line of text on my bicep right here, which hurt like crazy. I've never cringed in pain more in my life than that thing. And it simply says, only in surrender am I truly free. It meant a lot to me about like how my life is supposed to be lived for God is in surrender to him. And then somewhere along the way, I saw somebody have a tattoo on the forearm right here. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Because you can look down and see it all the time. And I started to think about, if I could get one more thing tattooed there, what would it be? Uh, And many of you have probably seen it. I have a, a heart on my sleeve. And it's a broken heart. And it's a reminder to me that God's heart breaks for the world. And so should mine. So should mine. So should ours. And unfortunately, what has happened in the church over the last 15, 20 years is that the church is known more for being judgmental towards the world and getting in fights with one another in the church and being judgmental towards each other in the church rather than allowing our hearts to break for the world around us. Like, Paul is in anguish in this passage for his people. He is in anguish that he knows people by name who don't know Jesus, and it's tearing him up inside. Who are your people, and how do you feel about them? Does your heart break for the world? We live in a world, right? If the Roman church is divided, we live in a world where churches are divided more than ever because we live in a country that is divided more than ever. And we're going into what seems like another highly contested election season. Sure, it's two years away, but you know it's going to ramp up from here on out. We're going to be all sick of politics by the time we hit 2024. And what's going to happen? Things are just going to get stirred. Things are going to get stirred in the world. There's going to be more things that stir us up that get us all riled up, and we have an option. Are we going to be judgmental towards the world? Judgmental towards one another? 
or allow our hearts to break for those who are in need. See, what Paul is saying here is that the thing that should motivate us to engage in God's mission in the world is mercy. God's mercy. Because we're all in need of it. This is what he says in verse 30. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. Again, speaking to the Gentiles. The Jews have a hard heart. They have rejected God. They have wandered away. So therefore, God brought you into his family in spite of their rejection. You, who have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too, verse 31, now have become disobedient. Again, they have a hard heart. They have rejected God. In order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Hopefully seeing like, oh, God is treating them with favor and grace, which is a sign and a reminder oh, that he offers that same thing to us as well. For, though, for God has bound everyone, he says in verse 32, over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. God is trying to say, Paul is trying to say that, that we are all in need of mercy. And so therefore we should remind ourselves that it's not we who are the judge. It's not we who sit in judgment over others. Rather, it's God who's the judge. God is the judge, and in his justice, in his righteousness, there will come a day when he will sort all of it out. So in the meantime, the call for me to engage in his mission is through a posture of mercy, because it is mercy that is the motivator for God's mission in the world. And I wonder if that's why Paul ends chapter 11 the way that he does, with this kind of big sweeping reflection on who has known the mind of Christ? Who has understood God? Who has really captured all of who God is? He says in verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. So to him be glory forever. Amen. Like recognizing, like, like, I don't know how all this works out. It says right there in verse 33 that unsearchable are his judgments. He's the one who's the judge. He's the one who sorts it all out. He's the one who puts all the pieces back together. And so when we stand and we're confronted with the mysterious nature of how is he going to do this? How is he going to work his plan of salvation for the entire world? Our response in part should be worship. It should be like he is much bigger much more vast than I could ever imagine. And our other response should be mission. Worship and mission should be the two foundational pillars of the church that when the world looks at us, what they see is we are so enthralled with who God is for his love for us that we can't help but extend it to other people. And I think when the world sees the church operating like that, then they're like, oh, maybe I want in on that. Because mercy is the motivator of God's mission. So who are your people? And how do you feel about them? You know, a couple years ago, um, 2018, I think, I was walking home from dropping my kids off at school one day, and there was this guy who was broke down in his car in our neighborhood. And he had just got released from the hospital. He was in a bad, bad way, bad shape. And I walked by, and he had had a flat tire, and he couldn't even get out of his car, and he just leaned out, and he said, hey, can you help me? And so I spent the better part of my morning trying to help him and get a tire and get him sent on his way. And through that interaction, he learned that I was a pastor, and he learned that I was a pastor here at Meadowbrook Church. And so sure enough, that next day, he showed up, or that next week, he showed up here at our church. And was such in a bad way from his injury and being in the hospital that he couldn't walk, so he was in a wheelchair, and he was wheeling all around the lobby, and he was needing help, and people in this church were wildly helpful to him. I mean, for about a whole month, the summer of 2018, he was here all the time. Many of you probably remember him who were here then. He would sit on the front row, and he would, like, have people wait on him from the cafe. People would get him pillows, and he would, like, almost lay down, and they'd be like, hey, can somebody refill my coffee? 
And like Meadowbrook Church served him and loved him better than any group of people I could ever imagine would serve him and love him. I mean, he literally was a mess and people were pushing him around in his wheelchair and just loving on him and helping him and getting him clothes and getting him stuff. It was amazing to watch this church have mercy on this guy. But near the end of that summer, I began to wonder, like, is he taking advantage of us? Like, is he taking advantage of me? Like, he would show up to my house middle of the week, high as a kite, needing things. And I would, you know, try and help him the best that I could. And then there was this point, the reason he stopped coming in here is because we had to ask him to stop coming here because he stole something from one of our church members. And then we fortunately got it back, but we had to get the police involved and they just said, he can't come back to your church anymore. And I was like, that's probably wise. And I've thought about him a lot ever since then. Because he was in our house, and my kids ask about him from time to time. And they say, whatever happened to them? And you know, I try and do my best to tell them. But I've always wondered, if he were to walk back in here, how would I treat him? There's a passage in James, James 2.13, that says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. I think in my heart I'd be quick to judge, to condemn. But I wonder if the response would be to have mercy, to hear his story, to try and understand him more deeply and find a way to welcome him back in. I'm confident that, that as a church, there are people who would be like, I would be first in line to do that. And the conversation that we should have is like, how do we become those people? who are quick to have mercy rather than judgment because mercy, as we see through Jesus, triumphs over judgment. Someday we will all have to be accountable before God for the way we lived our life. But for those who recognize their need for mercy and place their trust in Jesus, God says, I will offer it continually again and again and again. And only when we see our need for it do we have the ability to extend it to others? Because mercy is the motivator for God's mission in the world. So may you see and may you know that mercy triumphs over judgment. May you realize just how much mercy God through Christ has extended to you and may that compel you to extend his mercy to the world around us. And in doing so, may we see many more people come to faith in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and what it means to us as people who are recipients of it. And we acknowledge and confess, Lord, that there's a lot of mystery in it. We don't fully understand how it works or how you net it out or how someday you're going to make all things right. It seems beyond our comprehension. But Lord, we also know that you make good on your promises and that you are a God who is faithful even when we're not. And so Lord, we ask this morning that we would be overwhelmed by your goodness and your grace that you have extended to us through Jesus Christ. Amen.